that of a nerve sheet tumor with uh, internal hemorrhaging. Uh, intraoperatively, uh, the surgery which was performed was a uh, laminectomy and right medial facetectomy of the fifth uh, thoracic vertebra and uh, gross total excision of the tumor was done. Intraoperatively, there were adhesions to the D5 nerve root and the D5 nerve root was hence sacrificed and the tumor was firm in consistency with areas of calcification and moving on to the histopathological examination. I, uh, I think your time is up probably. Okay. So, uh, in conclusion, uh, Let's conclude it. Yes, sir. Uh, in conclusion, uh, I would like to say that on post-operative imaging, uh, there was no uh, lesion which was found, there was no residual, and uh, post-operative outcome was that of uh, the patient had, uh, immediate post-operatively, the patient had a, a improvement in power in the right lower limb to 3 by 5, and on 3-month follow-up, the patient is able to ambulate without support, and also the child was delivered pre-operatively, uh, and child also is healthy at present. Yes. And histo on histopathological examination, uh, it was found to have uh, N-chondroma-like features. Uh, in conclusion, uh, this is a rare case report in a pregnant woman. Uh, as such, N-chondromas are ra rare in, uh, rarely reported in the spine. And this is one such case, specifically in a pregnant woman. Thank you, thank yes, you. Sir. Good article. Uh, uh, do you have contrast axial scan of preoperative period? Yes, sir. Mm. Yeah, it's not there. No. Pressing on uh, pregnancy, uh, have you searched the literature? Because personally, I am not aware. Does pregnancy aggravate these lesions and then they become symptomatic? Sir, there is no as such relation, but uh, there have been. Uh, uh, articles about having giant thoracic enchondromas in general adult males but uh, in relation to pregnancy there is uh, no such uh, and also uh, pregnancy i have given a stress because there are related preoperative and postoperative morbidities positioning of the patient exactly. that's why i have given a stress on that sir. you do not mention what position did you use uh, so this patient as it was uh, it was done in prone position because already the child was delivered at 8 months so we uh, we went ahead with the prone position. Just final uh, comments. What is your preoperative diagnosis? And uh, did you did you tell the gynec team to have a delivery early so that you could operate? Yes, sir. We had induced the uh, delivery earlier with preoperative steroids for the child for uh, lung maturity, and the child was stable post operative. So, yes. so, in retrospect, could you have delayed the surgery by a uh, one month or two months till that uh, child was mature? In uh, retrospect? So, uh, since it was a benign lesion, we could have uh, tried, but since uh, bowel and bladder involvement had started to occur, sir, so we would have still gone for the surgery, sir, uh, in my Thank opinion. Good morning, uh, sir. I am um, presenting. Uh, it's a, a study about relation between the symptomatic relief for recurrence of pain after primary microlumbaridoscopy for herniated disc and preoperative duration of pain. The study was aimed at whether there is any relation between uh, preoperative duration of leg pain and the postoperative relief for recurrence of pain. As we all know, microlumbaridoscopy is a widely used procedure to alleviate the pain and other symptoms due to herniated disc. And even though most of the patients get relieved of pain, there are instances like reappearance of pain postoperatively. It is unclear whether duration of leg pain due to disc herniation is related to postoperative relief of recurrence of pain. Even though there is international literature regarding this, no similar studies were conducted in patients from the Malabar region from Kerala. So, Methodology. This was a longitudinal study conducted among 50 patients who underwent primary microlumbar discectomy in the Department of Neurosurgery MS Medical College Hospital, Kerala. 
over a period of one year from January 2021 to December 2021 after getting approval from Research and Ethics Committee. Uh, patients aged more than 18 years with lumbar radiculopathy and confirmed by lumbosacral MRI were imaging were included. And patients, those who are not willing to participate in study and MRI lumb LS spine shows multiple levels of disc or herniations, spinal cala narrowing were excluded and also patients with diabetes mellitus, patients diagnosed with the Icona syndrome and patients with the herniated disc with history of previous lumbar surgery are also excluded. After obtain, obtaining written informed consent, baseline data and a questionnaire about the leg pain were variable duration. Less than three Can months. Can you just go to the results? We are running out of time. Just your results and conclusion. Oh, okay, sir. Okay. Okay. After obtaining data uh, from, okay, we came to the, reached the two results were postoperative pain in patients with preoperative pain for less than three month duration. And when uh, they had five percentage in postoperatively, they had uh, more pain, same or aggravated pain were seen in patients with more than uh, three months. Preoperative pain had 10 percentage in postoperative pain. Okay. Um, we brought, we analyzed it, okay, analyzed it using SPSS 23 and chi square test was done and p value were 0.1. It is not significant. And uh, from conclusion from the EVO study, we concluded that patients with short duration of perspective leg pain have better pain relief and better prognosis than those with long duration of leg pain. No, time is up. The, okay. Time is up. Okay. Uh, just one question. Uh, have you taken the account of uh, severity of preoperative pain vis-a-vis -vis relief, the severity of the pain index in the preoperative period? Um, the VAS score or some score in the preoperative period vis-a-vis -vis relief in the postoperative period. And second question is, uh, what was the modality of surgery in all cases? Was so, it MIS in some cases and microdiscectomy in the other cases? Uh, micro lumbar discectomy only, sir. In all the cases. Surgery. And uh, single surgeon or multiple surgeon? Sir? Single surgeon or mu multiple surgeon? Single surgeon. Sir. Okay, so, so have you taken the account of preoperative vis-a-vis -vis postoperative pain? Uh, sir, pardon, sir? Preoperative pain score versus uh, vis a vis post operative yes, pain score. Yes, sir. Yes. Take it into account. Uh, post operative pain um, score was like we assessed according to whether the pain was uh, no pain or mild and or. There is no scaling that you, uh, scale that you have used. A scoring system you have not used. It is a subjective criteria. That yes, is sir. Criteria. Subjective type. Thank pain. you. Yes, sir. Next. Good afternoon, everyone. My topic is posterior calvary augmentation in multisucular craniosynostosis. So, for long, frontoorbital advancement has been the workhorse of craniosynostosis management. So, how does this posterior calvary augmentation? So, we have seen that in syndromic patients, the incidence of carry malformation is very high, except the patients of APERT syndrome, which is 1.9%. So, that is why not only this, it also decreases ICP more than the frontoorbital advancement, as we will see. So, what we did, uh, what we do in this is we remove, remodel, reposition, repair, and reconstruct the posterior part of the fossa as I have enumerated in the various steps and you can also scan the QR code to see the video of the operative, uh, operative video. Uh, so there was uh, this patient, uh, another patient, we usually use uh, tongue in groove meandering technique to uh, do craniotomy in patients of uh, craniosynostosis. And uh, uh, as we can see in, uh, in this child, which was having hydrocephalus and chiari malformation, the, after the final construct, there was an adequate advancement was achieved. Uh, and uh, this posterior calvarial augmentation usually is used for correction of skull deformity and it reverses ICP and it increases more volume per mm than the frontoorbital advancement as much as 35% of skull wall uh, surface area is increased. So this PCVR can be used as uh, the frontoorbital uh, until, uh, until the need for frontoorbital uh, uh, advancement after the first year of life. 
So posterior canvas real uh, vault augmentation is the, now the gold standard in multi-sutural cranial sinusosis, uh, intracranial hypertension, uh, and as the first surgical technique in the two-stage protocol, also known as the Birmingham technique. Uh, and then I would like to end with saying, if problem is at the back, operate at back. Thank you. Oh, good. Uh, so uh, two cases, sir. I've uh, shown first is the tongue and groove technique, which was in the first patient, which I have shown the various steps, and the second patient, this. Uh, uh, in this patient, that uh, a different technique was used because he, uh, she was already having a, a shunt, and um, so we have to reconstruct so uh, it did with he, absorbable. Did, did he use a distraction technique? Huh? Did no, he use a distraction? Didn't use distraction technique. And the most important point in this, uh, which uh, I didn't mention also, was the dissection around the torcula, which is the most important point uh, we should consider while doing posterior care. So you just uh, did a you know posterior approach and. And yes, what is the what is the material used for fixation uh, and remodeling? Absorbable plates were used, uh, so that. Okay. Uh, and you can also see in the CT scans that uh, the nine month post surgery that uh, it has already been fused. That there is no uh, signs of it, sir. But there was obviously uh, we got time because of that, so and, that we can and, do front orbital advancement. Your, your carry did it get reversed? Did uh, you did you get MRI? There's a carry apparently, right? Yeah, carry is also there, sir. Uh, that is maybe not. So, uh, but it is apparent. So uh, did yeah. it get reversed? No. Sir, uh, did you get a post-op uh, MR? Uh, post-op CT scan was in post-op MR. You've not got an MR. MR. Thank you. So yes, sir, uh, that were done. Uh, I've not shown here, but uh, she uh, she was actually not having any uh, craniometric. I mean, facial craniomorphological deformity. That was mostly for hydrocephalus in the second patient. But uh, in the first patient, which I have not shown the face, uh, in that uh, there was cranio. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sir. Uh, Vishnu, Dr. Vishnu Gupta. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, uh, my topic is uh, study of microsurgical anatomy of middle cerebral artery in human cadaveric brain. So MC is uh, most complex, largest artery system, and uh, dissection study uh, improved knowledge and uh, very helpful in micro neurosurgeries. So in this study, the aim of the study was the study of microsurgical anatomy and variation of the MCA in cadaveric brain, and uh, compared it with the existing literature. Uh, we observed the uh, Following things, uh, following in MCA is outer diameter, outer diameter of MCA, length of MCA, number of perforators from MCA, branching pattern of MCA, dominance of uh, trunk, and the uh, uh, arising of perforators. So we find, uh, we found that the average length of MCA was around 3.28 mm, while length was 24.2 mm. The branching pattern, 60% uh, had uh, bifurcation, 20% had trifurcation, 15% had uh, multiple for, uh, branching pattern. And in 5% cases, there is no branching. Uh, in uh, dominance, uh, in total of uh, 9 uh, cases, we see in dominance of inferior trunk. In 7 cases, dominance of uh, uh, superior trunk. In 4 cases, dominance of uh, no dominance was seen. And the perfor uh, perforators was arise mostly from the, uh, throughout, the uh, throughout the trunk from the uh, M1. Uh, so uh, this is study. Uh, uh, after comparing the study from the other studies, uh, there is the uh, in this study the MC had many variations along its course, and the length of the M1 segment is longer, and the uh, branching pattern we observe is different from Western literatures. And third one is the origin of the perforators were different from our existing Indian literature. Thank you. What was the difference in uh, the origin of the perforators as compared to the Western population? Sir, uh, sir uh, previous studies are uh, done uh, done by uh, done by Yasargil and uh, done by uh, Rotons. The perforators arise from the mostly arise from the inferior medial part of the uh, M1 MCA. While in my study, the origin of uh, perforators, uh, medial group, intermittent group, and lateral group are uh, same in all. 
I mean, how is it different from the Western population? You said yeah, your finding was like it was different from the Indian population has got perforator origin at different sites as compared to Western population. So what was the difference? Did sir, you get the question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Sir, actually, uh, uh, the difference from Western studies are mostly in the uh, length and uh, the branching pattern. So not on the origin, right? Origin is different from the previous Indian studies, sir. Okay, thank you. How many cases were there in the 20, 20. In the cadaver, both sides, right and left MC, or how was it? Sir, actually, uh, we uh, get the hemisphere, hemisphere only from the, our uh, category lab, sir. Next, next is Dr. Pankaj Totla. Good morning, everyone. My topic for e-poster is usage of miniature training models for the head fixation in neurosurgery. As we know, there are numerous complications which are reported with the head fixation, which include EDH, depressed skull fracture, pneumocephalus, air embolism, skin laceration, so on and so forth. These complications are devastating and at times can endanger the, endanger the life of the patient. But the good thing is these complications can be avoided with the proper training of the neurosurgical residents. So, to plan and practice a particular head fixation as per the case scenario, we have used handmade models of the Mayfield and Sugita clamp and also of the skull. These head fixation frames, both Sugita and Mayfield, are made up of just wood and metal, while the head frame is made up of ABS plastic and 3D pen. The raw materials to make these uh, models are easily available and costed us less than one US dollar. So these products are easy and very much reasonable for the limited resources set up like India. Patient specific head fixation were carried out in the pre-operative planning using these handmade models and the exact positioning was replicated. As we see in the photos, sorry. Yes, we'll come to the questions because we have seen that. Yeah. As we, in the see, as we see in the photo, the head fixation was initially planned, the RMSC was initially planned on the model, and then it was replicated exactly on the patient. In this photo, we have planned the um, carrion or cranitomy on the model, and it was replicated exactly on the patient. So these handmade models, which cost us less than one US dollar, help us in planning case specific and head fixation for a particular case, following which pins were applied with the high accuracy and safety thus decreasing the complication related with the head fixation and helped us in our mission to save lives. Thank you so much. Uh, just a question. Uh, you have applied these frames which you have made on, first on the 3, 3D printing, you know, and then you applied on the patients. Yes, so we practice a particular head fixation which is specific for the patient yeah. using uh, these head models and then we replicate, their photographs were taken for the reference and it was replicated exactly in the operating room. Yeah, so uh, did you use existing Sugita frame or you you made your own frame? Sir, we have both Sugita and Mayfield frames available. So yeah, but you, you designed your own frame, right? And yes, then you sir. put the screws. The only yeah. question is what advantage are you getting by this? Uh, by, by, by sir, because system? many times the new neurosurgical trainees get confused with the site of pin application because many times patients have some uh, skull fractures or previous shunt or previous surgical sites and exactly pin positioning varies from the patient to patient and case to case. Okay. So for a particular case and for a particular patient, we need to design our um, specific head positioning which we can practice with help of these models and the complications can be avoided with this. Uh, so there has to be some comparison, right? Some benchmark between like new trainees using Mayfield, routine Mayfield, and this for us to, you know, get us, get a conclusion that this really helps. It's a good, uh, you know, it is an encouraging concept, but the proof of concept lies with some amount of comparison. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. So, uh, thank you all presenters for the poster session. We now conclude this session.